He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora, I'm William Ray. Welcome to Black Sheep, a show all about the villainous, controversial and sometimes misunderstood figures of New Zealand history. Today we're telling the story of a man with a difficult legacy. He's one of Aotearoa's greatest figures, but he's also often held responsible for starting the bloodiest war in our history. New Zealand goes through this annual day of mourning, state-sponsored mourning, um, during Anzac Day, where we recall the, now it's all wars, but traditionally it was the the First World War, where 18,000 New Zealanders were killed. And yet the musket wars, you got 20,000 Māori killed. That's, that's the biggest conflict, series of battles, wars, um, in New Zealand history. That's Paul Moon. He's a history professor at Auckland University of Technology who specialises in the early colonial period at the start of the 1800s, when European traders introduced the guns which turned ongoing low-level conflicts between Māori tribes into a nationwide bloodbath, which today we call the Musket Wars. And for better or worse, those wars are inextricably linked to one man, Napui chief Hongi Hika. He had more men and more guns than anyone else, and he used them in ways no one else did. If he'd never been born, the musket wars might still have happened, but they could have been very different. I don't think it would have happened on that scale. And the fact that he was able to get together war parties of one or two thousand or three thousand, in some cases perhaps three thousand men, no other chief could achieve that. And again, it's not the weapons, it's not just one or two victories. He's the total leader, the leader that manages war with the economy, with diplomacy, with political success. And he manages it for year after year after year. I don't think you can really point to another chief who did anything on that scale for that long. The question of Hongi's role in the musket wars is a tricky one for Ngāpui. Hongi's one of their greatest figures, laying responsibility for the most horrific war in New Zealand history at his feet. It doesn't sit well with them. I think it would be a mistake to think of him as a war, as a, as a, as a war leader. He was uh, much more revered, at least amongst us in the north, as a diplomatic, kind, benevolent adjudicator. Hami Piripi is a former head of the Māori Language Commission and chairperson of Te Runanga o Te Rawara. He knows Hongi's story inside out, which you'd expect because they're related. Hongi is Hami's tūpuna, one of his ancestors. Hongi was born around 1772, just as Captain Cook was setting off on his second voyage to New Zealand. He grew up in a society where warfare was endemic. One tribe would raid another, that would trigger a counter-raid, which would prompt another raid, and it goes on and on. If we wage war like this today, we'd end up wiping out life on Earth pretty quick. But it wasn't like that in pre-European New Zealand. Paul Moon again. Rough estimates put traditional Maori warfare delivering a death toll, perhaps 10 or 20 people in an encounter, perhaps up to 60 in some cases. In fact, there are a number of encounters where groups fought and no one was killed. And so while there may have been the cycle of uh, revenge or cycle of avenging past wrongs, they weren't necessarily costly in terms of human life. And as a result of that, people could go back to production, which is the main function of the community. Warfare could be highly controlled, even ritualised. Chiefs could agree to rules in advance about where combat would happen, how long the battle would go on for. Setting limits on the bloodshed made sense because as a chief, you know that if your side slaughters too many of your enemies, then they'll feel obliged to come back and get utu, a word that usually gets translated as vengeance, but really means something more like a balanced exchange. Muskets eventually change that, but not straight away, as Hongi learns tragically in 1807. One of Hongi's older relatives was leading a raid to the south. His men are armed with a small number of muskets which they got from European traders. They were soon squaring up against the forces of Ngāti Whātua, led by a chief called Murupāinga. The missionary, Samuel Marsden, wrote this about the battle. When the two contending parties met in the field of battle, Muru Paenga, knowing that the enemy was armed with muskets, directed his men that when the enemy advanced and were on the point of firing their muskets, to lie that instant flat upon the ground, and as soon as they had discharged their muskets to rush upon them. This stratagem succeeded. The enemy's shot passed over his men when they instantly rushed upon them, threw the hole into disorder, killed a number of their chiefs. The chiefs that escaped saved themselves by flight and returned home with only 15 men, the rest killed or taken prisoners. 
This is where you see the first inkling of the man Hongi will become, because despite seeing the muskets fail spectacularly, he embraces them and uses them to totally revolutionise Māori warfare. I think it's another example of his foresight. The weapons potentially had a lot of destructive capabilities. He saw that. Others didn't necessarily see that. So he had to educate himself from scratch. It wasn't like any European military leader who would have years of training, years of experience. Hongi had to learn this firsthand and really devise his own tactics for musket warfare. Hongi rises to become the leader of his people, partly through a success in combat, but also through diplomacy. One of the groups he's keen to make friends with is European missionaries. Hongi wasn't particularly interested in Christianity. In fact, he once described it as, quote, the religion of slaves. But he had other reasons for wanting to keep Europeans close. Partly for access to muskets, but more importantly for access to technology for producing potatoes for cultivating the ground. Once he was growing potatoes, and he eventually ended up doing this on an industrial scale, once he was growing those potatoes, he could supply them in huge quantities to New South Wales in return for weapons. There's one account, and I don't know if it's true, we we can't tell, but there's one account from the oral histories which asserts that there was so much emphasis put on growing food for export to be traded for muskets that some communities suffered starvation. Potatoes played a huge part in the musket wars, and not just because they could be traded for guns. Potatoes are a perfect fighting food. Kumara might be tastier, at least in my opinion, but back in the 1800s, they only grew about as big as one of your fingers and were tricky to carry on long journeys without rotting. There were also strict rules attached to kumara, which meant only men could grow them. Potatoes, on the other hand, could be grown by women, which freed up more men for fighting. In fact, some historians who have spent decades researching the musket wars say potatoes were so important, the conflict should really be renamed the Potato Wars. For some reason, that's never caught on. Growing potatoes meant Hongi could feed a much larger fighting force than any chief before him. And that's significant. If you look at other very famous chiefs, um, Kote Afa, for example, famous Napui chief, when there was a rumour that they were going to be invaded by Ngāti Whātua, he couldn't get enough troops to come with him to mount a defence, and so he ended up putting tree branches on the ridge of a hill and lighting fires behind them, so it gave the impression from a distance that there were these men lining the ridge of the hill, just branches of trees with fires behind them. Um, Honeheke, at the conclusion of the Northern Wars in 1846, by some estimates, he only had 20 troops, 20 soldiers with him at the conclusion of that war. So many of these famous chiefs, great military leaders often had problems mobilising men. By and large, Hongi didn't have that problem. Being on the other side of one of Hongi's raids must have been a terrifying experience. You've grown up in a society with hundreds of years of experience of war being fought up close with relatively small numbers of warriors wielding patu, mere, taiaha, close combat weapons. Suddenly you're up against thousands of enemies armed with metal weapons that spit fire and death. I think it's hard for us to conceive what it would be like when everyone's familiar with a certain sort of warfare on a certain scale, to be confronted with something like what Hongi achieved. It's, it's perhaps equivalent in some ways to the shock the world felt uh, during the opening years of the First World War, where there was industrial-scale killing. People weren't anticipating anything like that. It was beyond their imagination. And Hongi, similarly, the things that he did were, were beyond the imagination of most people in New Zealand at the time. The survivors of Hongi's raids learned a hard lesson. If they didn't adopt these new weapons and learn how to use them, they wouldn't survive. It's this realisation that ultimately leads to the musket wars. But before those wars properly get underway, Hongi Hika leaves New Zealand. He travels all the way across the world, and in doing so, he becomes instrumental in saving the Māori language as we know it. He does this with the help of a missionary friend of his, Thomas Kendall. Kendall had produced a book which was partly a dictionary, partly a phrase book, partly a grammar, designed to assist missionaries to learn Māori and also designed to teach Māori to read. It wasn't a great book by any stretch of the imagination and there were complaints about it almost from the outset. So one of the things that Kendall decided to do, he thought he would go to England to take Hongi and another chief, Waikato, with him, take them to Cambridge University where they'd be involved in producing a much more thorough dictionary and grammar of the Māori language. Writing a dictionary might not sound that exciting, but for Hami, this is probably Hongi's greatest act. By the creation of an alphabet and orthographic conventions for language use, 
um, Hongi saved the language. Uh, at, his, at that particular point in time, if you look around other 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 lang- other similar cultures around the world, indigenous nations who were colonized at the time, either by the French, the Spanish, the Germans, the British, what happened? They lost their language. And um, uh, unless you can capture it and, and get it into written form so that you can continue to instruct your next generations in it, um, you would lose it along with the with the lives of your ancestors. Mm-hmm. And so uh, what Hong, in my mind, what Hongi's greatest contribution to us was, was the completion of that first alphabet. Think about that. Every time you read a Māori word, you're reading it as Hongi and his fellow chief Waikato said it should be written. And imagine being in Hongi's shoes, wandering around the streets of London in 1820. A man from a culture that had only just begun adopting iron tools, mixing with a culture at the height of the Industrial Revolution. But he seems to have rubbed shoulders with English high society just fine. He was a a, a regular guest speaker at at aristocratic events, um, which is amazing. And his friend Waikato, they were were celebrities, really, because the British didn't suffer fools. So you can be sure that they must have been charming and eloquent. It's bad enough that you know, they got full-faced mokos on their face. You know that, that, that itself would probably be a, a, perhaps it's a novelty, but they 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 highly respected them. At one stage, Hongi met the king and was presented with a suit of armor. According to some stories, he wore it in battle when he returned to New Zealand, which led to rumors he was bulletproof. But Hongi didn't visit England for a holiday. And he was very astutely observing the nature of English society and particularly the strength of the military in Britain. And I think he learnt a lot about what it meant to have a large military at your disposal and the sort of power that came with it. And he studied tactics a lot. He studied Napoleon. Apparently, yes. And he had to. This wasn't some intellectual exercise to satisfy his curiosity. It was literally a life and death issue for him. When he went back to New Zealand... He had to be prepared to deal with potential enemies who, in the meantime, had been acquiring muskets themselves. One strategy Hongi pursues in London is to get better quality weapons. The ones he had were so old and shoddy they'd sometimes explode and kill the warrior trying to fire it. He manages to secure a haul of brand new weapons thanks to a bit of trickery and a naive British aristocrat called Baron de Theory. Baron de Theory um, said, you know, um, I can get you some muskets. And uh, Hongi said, well, I, I can give you half an island if you like. So, <laughs> so, so uh, de Theory you know, sent a message through, through to, to Sydney, got them to begin making the muskets so they could be ready for when Hongi sailed back to pick up. Sure. So Hongi sails back and picks them up and says, thank you, Baron de Theory will be paying for those. And, and brings them back, and poor old Baron de Thierry couldn't afford it. He got locked up in jail because he couldn't afford to pay that, 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 that invoice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he came here after he got out of jail, he came here, and, yeah. and, uh, and then he went to, over to Hokianga and sat on the mountain and said, I now own this, I own this land, everyone laughed at him, and so he went back to Australia. Pretty that's, good deal for Hongi then. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. He was an astute diplomat. Hongi and his new muskets wreak havoc on the battlefield, ranging far from his homeland in Northland to raid the Thames Peninsula and Bay of Plenty. One time his warriors dragged their waka for days overland so they could reach a par on an island in one of the lakes of Rotorua. His ability to launch campaigns across that kind of distance with such large number of warriors was totally unprecedented. But Hongi wasn't like Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great, seizing more land for his people. He had other motivations. He took over a place, uh, conquered it, and then moved on. That tells you that he was doing what he was doing there was to satisfy some other requirement. He was a traditionalist. He never went anywhere uninvited, as it were. He 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 went to settle a score or to you know some something of that nature. But every time Hongi settles one of these scores, he's introducing more Māori to this new kind of warfare, where technology makes the death toll exponentially higher. The area around Auckland is virtually deserted, as tribes raided by Hongi abandon their homes and flee, spreading the story of his new killing machine and launching musket-armed raids of their own on tribes further to the south. Each tribe sees its neighbours arming themselves with muskets and realise that if they don't do the same, they won't stand a chance. It's like a chain of tumbling dominoes which reach all the way down to the bottom of the South Island and even out to the Chatham Islands. 
Estimating the exact scale of the musket wars is tricky, but it's thought to have killed as many as 20,000 people. And bear in mind that at the beginning of the 19th century, it's possible, we don't know for sure, but it's possible that the entire Maori population in New Zealand was between 100 and 120,000 people. Take out 20,000 of those in one generation. That gives you a sense of the scale of destruction that those muskets wrought. Um, You'd have to go to a few countries in the First World War. I think um, Serbia lost one in four people in the First World War. I think that's the figure, one in five. So that's a comparable loss. And if you look at those countries that have suffered a loss on that magnitude, it's hugely traumatic. And that trauma extends for for generations after generations. Don't think that it just ends when the people involved die because it disrupts so much of life, it causes so much grief and trauma that it just perpetuates. I think also that if you're looking at it from the point of view of hindsight, you can see that the great disruption that was caused during that period, if you like, softened up Maori society for the arrival of the British in the late 1830s and and certainly the influx after the treaty in 1840. Here's the thing. If we hold Hongi responsible for the musket wars, then all that falls on his shoulders. But should we? After all, we're looking at how his actions played out with nearly 200 years of hindsight. Hongi didn't have that privilege. He didn't believe in wasting human life. That's one thing we know for certain. Everything had to have a good reason. And so um, presented with good reasons on reflection would most definitely have changed his approach. As with anyone, any 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 war uh, participant. I guess there's this, there's just debate about all kinds of people, like um, I don't know, like Genghis Khan or Alexander mm. the Great. Can you really judge them because mm. you weren't part of that society? You don't know what was thought of as good and bad. Yeah, he had to make choices, and he had been trained in the in the school of a Maori aristocracy on how to make those choices. I mean, he was he was most certainly shaped by the trauma of. Of, of warfare, and that's probably what created the the warlike demeanour, and but uh, but only when it was necessary. <laughs> also, this story isn't all about Hongi. It's not even all about Maori. British authorities in New South Wales had it in their power to stop that musket trade. As they talked about it, they said it was injurious to the indigenous population of New Zealand, but they did precious little to stop it. In the early 1820s, if, if you sat down to eat your Sunday lunch in Sydney, the chances are that the pork, the roast pork you were eating and almost certainly the potatoes you were eating were produced in New Zealand by a Maori community somewhere in Northland. And if it took muskets to keep that trade going, so be it. Not all Europeans were involved in fanning the flames of war. In fact, some missionaries went to extraordinary lengths to end the violence. As we've said earlier, Hongi never became a Christian, but he did have close relationships with the missionaries, and ultimately, that's what leads to his death in 1828. The missionaries are a group of Wesleyans based in Whangaroa, and they had threats for a couple of weeks beforehand. Um, A very small group of Maori in in the vicinity were threatening to get rid of them. They started to intimidate them more and more and they escalated the tension and then one night there was a a full-blown raid and the missionaries escaped with really all they had on them and that was it and they ran through the bush for several kilometres through the night to get to the nearest mission station and this in turn led to Hongi sorting it out by occupying the pa where this community was based and in the course of a subsequent battle relating to that that's when he got the, the wound that eventually he died from. Hongi lingered for almost a year with a bullet in his lungs. According to one of the missionaries who visited him, he had a sort of party trick where he'd deliberately make this weird wheezing noise by breathing through a hole in his chest. Right up until the day he died, he was planning more raids. But he never fights another battle. The people of Napui bury him in secrecy. The fact he died at all is kept secret for a long time. It leaves such a, such a vacuum in your, in your social organisation that you can't afford for the wrong influence to spill into that vacuum. So it was a question of managing the news of his death and also managing the place of his burial. There was concern about what would happen when when Hongi died, when news got out. In fact, I think there was almost an element of defeatism among some of his followers that we're done for now because we don't have the great man to protect us anymore. We don't have a single leader who can fill his shoes and keep going with this this program that he started. 
In the end, nobody's able to continue Hongi's legacy. Partly it's because his successors seem to lack the raw talent Hongi had for military, economic and diplomatic leadership. But also, times had changed. While Hongi was the fulfilment of all this evolution, he was the apex of the evolution of a traditional chief over many centuries, he was its termination point. Because, in a way, Hongi's death heralds the beginning of a new sort of chief, one that has to contend much more with the forces of colonisation. Different skills are required. Europeans become less the unequal partner that they were in the 1810s and 1820s. And certainly, if you go forward a couple of decades to Honeheke, that Europeans have the upper hand in parts of the country. Special thanks to Paul Moon and Harmi Pitipi. I know I say this every week, but if you like this podcast, please take the time to rate it on iTunes and share it with your mates. Also, check out RNZ's other podcasts. You can find them on the series and podcasts page on our website, rnz.co.nz. Next week, we look at the history of a really bad idea. The survival of the fittest that Darwin had you know, talked about quite generally became literally we are the fit. And, you know, the unfit don't have any rights, they don't have any value. Black Sheep was written and presented by me, William Ray, edited by Jason McClellan and Mark Chesterman. The executive producer is Tim Watkin.